Remember as a kid you used to play games like Super Mario Brothers or Street Fighter and you could keep fighting and keep playing until you ran out of lives. What happened when you ran out of lives? Game over. What are we talking about today is a market crash and the possibility that we're in a real estate bubble right now. I'm going to be focusing on the Sudbury market because that's the only one in the world that I'm familiar with. I'll try and provide some value to people that might not be as familiar or they don't do this for their career day in day out. Maybe I can give you uh, some insight what I see every day on the job as a real estate agent in the greater Sudbury area. I think there's a fact that we can't avoid and that is housing prices are going up faster than incomes. Talking about rising housing prices might be scary. Before we get to the why it's happening, I think we need to acknowledge why rising housing prices are a problem. And the truth is, the only reason they're really a problem is because incomes are not going up as fast as housing costs. So this means it becomes unattainable to buy a house for a lot of people. So this might seem great for the person that owns the house, but it's really not sustainable because somebody else who earns that same salary as you won't be able to buy the house from you later on. So this creates kind of a ripple effect, a waterfall effect. And the other problem is it creates two classes of people, one who own property and one who don't. The truth is if you bought a property just a couple of years ago in Sudbury or you've owned one for longer than that, it might have doubled in value in just several years. Incomes have not done the same thing. They've gone up gradually over time. Incomes are generally pretty measured. Now an individual salary might double over 10 years. But doing the same job and working in the same position, salary position, the value of that job cannot double. It's just not sustainable. The amount of productivity somebody putting out in the same job position, it just can't go up by two times in only 10 years. That would be extraordinary inflation for that to happen. So the fact that we've seen that in housing is cause for concern. Now that we have that out of the way and we understand why that might be a problem, let's talk about what has been happening. Undoubtedly, when you talk about housing inflation and the price of housing going up, people always bring up fraud and foreign investment. Maybe it's because I have a bias because our office in real estate does zero fraud and we do zero foreign investment. Not that we don't want to, it's just not the business that we're in. We don't really see those two things. Almost all of the investment that we do deal with comes from places like Toronto, Hamilton, Niagara, Places in Southern Ontario, almost none of it comes from outside of the province and by extension outside of Canada. It's really hard for us to assign foreign investment as a big problem. People don't typically invest large sums of money to earn a nominal return like three or 4%. What they're really doing when they bring money into Ontario is speculating. So they're expecting very, very large returns. Because these investments are tracked by the government, they really need to be extraordinary returns for it to be worth it. Same with fraud. You need to be receiving an incredible, incredible return for fraud to be worth it. The risk of going to jail or having all the money taken back is just too great for you to risk earning a 10% per year return on fraud. It just doesn't make sense. And another argument with this is saying people from foreign countries don't have the same impetus to be obedient to our laws, so maybe they'll engage fraud more readily than natural born Canadians. And again, I don't see that. All of the individuals I've worked with in the real estate market at least are very honest people and they come to Canada to enjoy the lifestyle here and to obey the laws. So even if the country they came from doesn't have as strict a moral code or a legal system as Canada, they do want to obey the Canadian system when they arrive here. This might contradict what I said before, which is I don't see lots of foreign and outside of Ontario investment, but what I mean is many of these investors have been here for several years, established Canadian citizenship, and plan on living here for the rest of their lives. These people are part of the Canadian economy. They are the same degree of Canadian as I am, having been born here. Let me go back to how I opened this video. Game over. How and when might the game over happen in the rising housing prices right now? How does the housing bubble pop? How does the housing run-up that's happened in the last few years end? Well, the truth is, the only way it really ends, in my opinion, is a game over scenario. You get game over in an old video game when you run out of lives. Running out of lives in the real estate market means one of the fundamental indicators goes bust and can't be renewed. The first linchpin of the real estate market increasing has to be investment returns. If the prices of properties rise enough that the investment is not earning a positive cash flow or a positive cash return, people will stop investing. This is kind of a ceiling for investment in my opinion. One of the reasons people like to invest in Sudbury rather than many other places has to be the positive cash flows. Now a few years ago, you could earn a tremendous and out of the ordinary cash flow from Sudbury real estate as compared to somewhere like Toronto or even Barrie. 
But that's not the case anymore, and why has that happened? Well, we learn in economics when there's an extraordinary profit to be made, more firms will enter to benefit from that profit. And that's exactly what's happened. We've seen many, many people come because they want to obtain that extraordinary profit in the Sudbury real estate market. But because so many are coming and there's so few to be sold, this naturally created a boom in the real estate market and we've seen prices go up dramatically. Now, there's still real estate trading hands today, but it's trading at a reduced rate compared to the cash flows that it was a few years ago. Now, a few years ago, it wouldn't be out of the ordinary to buy a place that earned a net 10% value of the property every year. Now, 10% is nigh unheard of, if not impossible to find. You might find 5%, 7% is kind of where we're sitting right now. So if you do the math, that's almost a third of the cash flows that we've lost in just a few years. Now, when you include the financing cost of these deals, they become pretty much just level. You're not earning a crazy cash return, maybe even going negative month to month. Finding one that produces a genuine cash flow year over year is rare now. That's why I say one of the lives of the real estate market, if we're talking in a video game analogy, is the cash flow. Now, like it or not, people come to Sudbury and invest in property here, whether it's multiple family or single family. Now, multiple family will always cash flow better than a single family. That's why we'll see lots of people buying single family homes and converting the basement into a second unit, an in-law suite to generate that extra income and make it look like a better investment on paper. Now, doing this, you can still earn extraordinary cash flows, but again, more and more people entering, they price the properties higher and higher, and these extraordinary profits go out the window. In a video game scenario, when you run out of lives, it's game over. One of the lives is investment return. Now, like it or not, people invest in Sudbury. About a third of the people living here rent. Now, you might be saying, yes, but rents have increased as well. Doesn't that justify the higher price of the investment real estate? Yes, rents have gone up, but not to the same degree that prices have. The rents on apartments have not kept up with the prices. You don't need to go to a bank and take a loan to rent an apartment. It's basically based on the landlord's discretion. So if rents go up, you could simply pay more of your disposable income to pay for that. If housing prices go up, the bank will refuse to lend to you. And this brings me to my next life in the real estate market that could be lost. Banks stop lending because incomes can't justify the amount of loans that they're trying to take. If you call your mortgage broker and say, I make $70,000 a year after taxes, they might approve you for up to $350,000 in real estate. Now that's great, but that barely buys a single family house in Sudbury anymore. Comparably renting something for a couple of thousand dollars a month, rather than paying a couple thousand in a mortgage payment, it might be preferable for someone to continue renting rather than buy at these heavily inflated prices. If banks decide to stop lending, or they refuse to offer you more money to go buy a more expensive property based on your income, then the market basically will suffer. People will just refuse to sell, because why would they want to sell for less than they bought it for? Basically, if incomes don't go up, real estate can't go up. Because of COVID-19, when the central bank decided to stimulate the economy, one of the places a lot of the money went was into new mortgages. So of course this created a housing boom. It's not that the houses themselves are more valuable, it's just people were able to pay more for the same house. Paying more for the same thing is inflation. So what you had is people with the same income suddenly able to afford 30 or 50% more house than they were before. And this led to a mass buying spree in real estate. Suddenly, instead of 350, you might be able to afford a house worth 500, which that house might be much nicer than your current one, and it makes sense for you to go buy. The problem is, not everyone can win in this system, and eventually someone's left holding the bag. And that's the people now. People that are trying to buy real estate now are buying two years ago's real estate at double the price. Two years ago, these mortgage lenders decided that 70,000 could afford double what it could before just because interest rates were so artificially low. Now, you might have heard many times the central bank plans on increasing interest rates, but it's gonna be very gradual, so the housing market won't experience a crash like you might expect unless something very drastic happens, and the reason is because they'll be raising them slowly. So what you can afford might go down just a little bit each month until it ends up what it was before COVID. That means we've really seen the most exciting part of the boom already. If interest rates go up, that's another life we've lost and we're one step closer to game over. Something that's been incredibly frustrating for me and for my clients is predicting what properties will sell for. Normally there's two things that determine the price of real estate, comparables 
and human behavior. We can find recent sales in the same neighborhood or in the same city, but have a similar size and similar bedrooms, similar bathrooms, similar square footage, similar lawn size, similar access to amenities. And this comparable system allowed agents like myself to tell our clients, this is what this is worth because it's based on recent sales. That has completely gone out the window in the last two years. And I think that's to the detriment of consumers. It's not logical and it's not sustainable. Like I said, the second part of this equation is human behavior. The fear of missing out is that if you don't get this house, maybe another one that you want won't come up for another six months. So people are willing to pay extra money for that security and it becomes a downward spiral. Every deal makes you feel like you'll never get a house and you start bidding more and more for the same properties. It's just not sustainable. Trying to predict what the highest bid on a property will be, you would essentially have to model the individual psychology of every buyer on a deal. I'm not saying I have a better system for avoiding bidding wars. I for one have defended bidding wars in the past. I think it's the most transparent and I think it's the fairest of all the systems that have been suggested. And it gives me pause when I see examples of people paying hundred, dollars $150,000 over asking price. Because for all we know, the next highest bid was only $10,000 over the asking price, and that seller therefore might have received extraordinary profit on a property that was not justified at that price based on comparables. Another life before we see game over in the real estate market is the lack of supply. If people decided to suddenly start building lots of housing in Sudbury, this housing boom would be over very quickly. I, for one, think development is absolutely essential. There's obviously a shortage in housing in Sudbury. We need more development, we need more buildings with multiple apartments, and we need more single-family homes. And the real problem with this is housing cannot be stockpiled. If you know the store shelves are going to be bare in the near future, you might just buy a little extra food. But with housing, that you just can't do that. On this note, there's something called housing starts that you can find. It's publicly available information. It's how many people broke ground last month on single family and multifamily properties. The numbers in the Sudbury area, considering how much of a shortage we have in housing, are startlingly low. Sometimes they're in the single digits for an entire month. We need a lot more development. Something tells me we're not gonna see the housing market cool off because of new builds for some time. There's something called stock to flow, and this is essentially how much of something there is compared to how much of it has traded hands. Stock and flow are two separate metrics. The flow is really good and great, but we need to be increasing the stock. If more units sell in one year than another, that's great, but that does nothing to house people that can't find an apartment or a house to live in. We need to be building more if there's a shortage in housing. Now, if ever we overdevelop and make too many houses and too many apartments, in my opinion, that's a good problem to have. If that ever does happen, we would be one step closer to a game over or a market crash. I've seen a lot of comments on places like Facebook complaining about the increased prices of rent. A common one is along the lines of greedy landlords are charging more for rent. And a common rebuttal is, well, the prices of properties are going up, so the rent has to go up with it. Both of these aren't really true. In a competitive market like rentals, landlords are price takers. If you don't like the price being offered for one, you could go find another apartment. The problem is right now there aren't enough apartments, so the price is being driven up through scarcity, not through greed. Because there is not just one or two or three landlords in all of Sudbury, there are literally thousands, you can't simply tally up the increase in price to greed on the part of landlords. When there are this many people competing, another argument that I've seen online and why the housing prices have increased is people want more space because of the pandemic, because they're working from home. They don't want to live in their tiny little home. They want something bigger so they can spread out and their kids won't drive them crazy. Again, this might be true for other agents, but at least for myself, I don't see this as a major driving force in the upward momentum. If there was, I think it would have created a shock in the market, but it wouldn't have been a sustained movement upward. And again, for the last two years, prices have been consistently increasing. It's not like people in late 2021 were saying, gosh, I've been working from home for a year and a half now, I want more space. That would have been a bump at the beginning and maybe sustained slight growth, but the amounts of increase in price we're seeing to me just aren't justified by something as simple as wanting more space. The truth is the way that a house is priced is not based on how much wood and siding and insulation costs. That has nothing to do with the sale price of a house. It's all based on comparables and it's all relative. What the house sold for down the street determines what yours is worth not the materials that went into building your house. If the materials are really superior to the one down the street, 
then your house might be relatively more expensive. But you don't price from the foundation up and say this house is worth this price because this is how much it costs to build. For instance, the duplex that my wife and I live in right now is almost a hundred years old. Probably only cost a couple of thousand dollars, inflation adjusted, to build it back then. But does that determine the price today? No, it's all based on relativity. When people pay crazy prices for one house down the street, it increases it for the entire street. Again, price is not a very important factor in determining how much a house is really worth as far as value. The price might double in just a few years on the exact same house. If people's incomes have stayed the same, then how does that explain how the same house could be worth twice as much just 10 years later? Now just in conclusion, I don't believe that housing bubbles are very common. Having lived through one just in 2007, which really by historical standards is not that long, we might be suffering from recency bias when it comes to housing crashes because we all lived through one. The truth is housing bubbles are very, very rare. This is something we talked about just before the 2021 election, but immigration has an important effect on our housing market as well. More people coming into the country and not enough new housing being built creates a housing pressure. If there's an increase in a certain demographic segment or a certain population in a short amount of time, the housing that's created, the new flow, needs to match that increase. And personally, I hold nothing against people that come here as immigrants. I think it's the best part of our culture. Both of my neighbors on either side of me are Italian immigrants, and we wouldn't have it any other way. They bring a ton of flavor and personality to the neighborhood. Many of the original builders of these houses almost 100 years ago, their families still live in the same house today, which is just amazing. And therein lies the problem that I'm trying to point out. If we're not building homes or converting singles to doubles or doubles to triple homes, creating more units for people to live in at the same rate as immigration, we're going to run into this problem time and time again. And again, I have nothing against immigration. It's actually really good for the economy to have more productive people in the country. The truth is, without immigration, Canada would be dwindling quite a bit. We don't have the birthing rates to sustain our population, so we really do need people from other countries to come here. But with our population increasing, we need to be building more housing. That's the key takeaway from this. And that would end the housing bubble overnight. Because the truth is, the reason the prices are increasing at such crazy rates it's not because people want to live in that specific house or that specific neighborhood. They just want to live in a house and there aren't enough of them. An explanation that I've seen a lot online is blaming people like home flippers and investors for the increase in prices. And while this inevitably does have an upward effect on the housing prices in a market, a combination of the many factors I've mentioned today will give anyone that's new to real estate a comprehensive understanding of what's really going on in the Sudbury real estate market. I'm going to leave in the description of this video a link to Investopedia with an explanation of market bubbles in the past. I personally am always trying to learn new tactics, new information. I'm always reading books to try and enhance my own knowledge. And I found this article to be very thorough. It gave very clear indicators of when a housing bubble is being formed. At the end of the day, I can't make up your mind for you. If you think we're living in a housing bubble, that's totally up for you to decide. But I encourage you to go check out the article on Investopedia. Do some research on your own to decide if this is really an unsustainable market boom that we're in. Or maybe this is just one of the many booms that we've experienced throughout the years. Now before you leave, make sure to subscribe and hit the bell so you'll always receive notifications when we release another YouTube video. Again, I'm Zachary Ireland. I'm a real estate agent for Home Life Green Team here in Sudbury. Can help you with investment, with personal homes, with recreational homes, any kind of real estate including commercial, and of course I specialize in investments. So do give me a call at the office. I'm leaving the phone number right here. Or the quickest and easiest way would just be to send an email that's in the description of this video. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next one.